Welcome to the Twist News. I'm Erica Gray. I made a statement in a broadcast and Love Alien called me on it when I basically said that the United States needed Russia to be a balance to the European Union. And she couldn't understand this. Why would I make such a statement? And I thought about it. That does sound pretty out there. I mean, it sounds really out there until you listen to this broadcast. So let's look at a little bit of history because when we go into the history, then you're gonna also understand the present. Uh, so the EU formed the European Coal and Steel Community in 1950, the Treaty of Paris, and it was official in 1951. Basically, the European Coal and Steel Community formed to prevent war between France and Germany, which were always at war and fighting. There were many, many different battles. And of course, World War I, World War II, by the pooling of coal and steel of these two countries, this would be the path to eliminate war. At the time, the Federalist, the Federalist ideology was gaining ground, and this is for the unity and Bobo's starting already. So, okay, so basically with the unification of the European... Okay, hold on. Okay, this is Bobo. This is... Oops. <laughs> Bobo, who keeps interrupting the show. So just wanted Bobo to say hi, and now it's time for, oh, it's time for Bobo to go. Oh. Oh. That's great. She just bit me. My own dog bit me. So basically, the European coal and steel community formed with Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany. In 1957 was the Treaty of Rome, and the Treaty of Rome brought together the same nations, but this time for a common market. The common market was a first step to political union, and the economic was viewed as the stepping stone to the political. And you have to understand the Federalist ideology that drove the founding fathers as well as these many key members of the European movement for the European project. It was viewed as reviving the old Roman Empire. There were actually leaders who mentioned that this would be like a revival. And this is going back like by 30 years ago with the Federalists and members of the European movement at that time. And they came from many leading positions within the governments of the European Union. There were many key players that, and still are, by the way, that are members and motors of the European project. So the idea was that in unity, if Europe would unite, that it would not only prevent war, but could become a leading player as well on the world stage. Around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a politician at the time, and his name was Jack Pose. And Jack Pose had become an MEP. He was a member of the European Parliament, but he was a major career Europhile. He was a Luxembourg politician. He was the head of finance and foreign affairs, and he worked within two cabinets, Jacques Santerre, who had been prime minister, as well as Jean-Claude Juncker. And both Santerre and Juncker became commission presidents. Jean-Claude Juncker is considered Mr. Euro himself, as he, prior to his becoming commission president, he helped draft some clauses having to do with the Euro. He's Mr. Euro. He was one of the first presidents of the Eurozone. Jean-Claude Juncker 
also won the Vision for Europe Award. So these were leading Federalists. So it wasn't Jacques Pose. So in 1991, Jacques Pose negotiated the Brioni Agreement that ended the 10-day war in Slovenia. And he declared, this goes to show you the thinking, he declared that it was the hour of Europe and not the hour of the Americas. I mean, he's just like running around town going on about it's the hour of Europe and not the hour of America. Because within this group or within the European movement, there was some anti-American sentiment. So this union is forming with a view to what is going to be good for Europe. It's not forming with the best interests of America in mind, but what's in its own interests. And it's following the path of becoming an empire. There was already discussions of an army and there were different ways that that was being worked out in the various treaties. And it started with the Western European Union and then that went south. And now there's PESCO and the Strategic Compass. And now there's talk of an actual defense union in the next treaty, full-fledged. So what, what the European Union did was with each treaty, they'd add on a little more and a little more to make them this empire along the lines of a federation, meaning that the nation states give their sovereignty. But there was anti-American sentiment. There was already talk many years ago of not wanting to rely on NATO. Like It was almost like they'd had it with the, the American supremacy, America having say on their continent through NATO. And so it's they started to kind of really just pay lip service to NATO. One of the pillars in our defense, that's bull. They wanted their own defense. Let me tell you what was happening with the United States. So in 1992, the Economist wrote that while the United States was worried, and this is going back in 1992, this is like a long time ago, that while the United States was worried about Japan, knocking it off its pedestal. It was the European community that would knock it off its pedestal. But if we look at each U.S. administration, every single one of them gave European unity carte blanche. Kennedy stated in a speech at Independence Hall on July 2nd, 1962, and he's speaking to the European economic community. The spirit is today most clearly seen across the Atlantic Ocean, the nations of Western Europe, long divided by feuds, far more bitter than any which existed among the 13 colonies are today joining together, seeking as our forefathers sought to find freedom and diversity and in unity strength. So he liked it. Then you had Ronald Reagan, and Reagan spoke in Strasbourg in 1985 while he's going on about the European coal and steel community and the 35th anniversary of the Schuman plan and saying all of this wonderful stuff. He says, I'm here to tell you that America remains as she was 40 years ago, dedicated to the unity of Europe. We continue to see a strong and unified Europe, not as a rival, but as an even stronger partner. This thing is going forward, this European project, with Federalist ideology, which is kind of an offshoot a little bit of a U.S. Federation, but think of it more on a world scale. Think of it more as an ideology that is new, modern, that views the nation state as a traditional outmoded form of government. And this is the ideology that drives this union. Our state department doesn't even pay attention. It goes whoop, right over their head. They're just, yes, this is wonderful. Our allies are allies. And meanwhile, there's a lot of decisions that are being made. There's a lot of anti-American statements that are just totally being ignored. And nobody is seeing the potential of this project, this European project. 
then steps in the media. Now, the media, at every single turn, reported that this thing was going to fall apart. The European Union is going to fall apart. And that would get a lot of people's attention. Now, mind you, nobody has any idea that this thing is really political. They think it's just an economic grouping. They don't even have a clue. They don't even pay attention. They think it's a non-entity. It's going to fall apart. Meanwhile, there's a trajectory of this thing just going like this. And literally, the world's blinded. Blinded. Media is blinded. Media reports it's going to fall apart. You have the sovereign debt crisis. They're reporting it's going to fall apart. Euro is going to collapse. No matter what the crisis, they were always reporting that it was going to fall apart. Even still today, you see, you, you see some of this. This thing's going to fall apart. Well, guess what? Not only didn't it fall apart, they were further tweaking it. Nobody's paying attention to the European movement. Nobody's paying attention that this empire is really not in American interests. It's in their own interests. It's a following its own path for what's good for it. And in some of those ways, they've absolutely stepped on America's toes. And we're going to go into some of those things. You've got different decisions and discussions, and our State Department doesn't pay attention. What do we do but in the Ukraine I want you to look at Ukraine, okay, as this is a real strategic land grab for Europe. And the United States starts this very anti-Russia campaign. I don't understand the basis of it. I know that there were decisions in Putin's early career that he had made and with the oligarchs and different things that were getting certain press. But somehow it went from that to this Russia aggression, this total campaign completely against Russia. And the next thing we're doing is we're tampering with Ukraine. And we're installing, a, we've got Victoria Newland and a puppet government. And she doesn't even like the Europeans, by the way. I mean, I don't even know what we were doing, but whatever we were doing, we stuck our nose in it and we tried to whittle away to make sure that Ukraine would come towards the West. But this is what we did that was also really dumb by engaging. Now, Europe is in on this conflict, but they're in on it for another reason. But we're now siding with Europe. We're essentially helping to build their empire. And I'm going to, the shocking part of this is going to come in like a minute or two. We're building their empire. So you might as well look at us as we're, we're building their empire and we're going to be butt lickers. Okay. <laughs> that's what we're going to be, is we're going to be butt lickers. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the future of the United States because I'm going to let you know what, what's going on. So if our State Department had paid attention to the really paid attention to what was coming out of the mouths of Federalists, and let's not even forget that the European Union is totally undemocratic. There's too much power in the center. Margaret Thatcher complained about it. Right now, the European Conservatives and Reformist Party are exposing this. There's too much power in the center. The power of the nation states are being whittled away. That's the issue with certain countries that have joined with the conservatives is they wanted to see more of a confederation because they don't like this federation and they feel that it's resembling the Soviet communist kind of hierarchy and decision making. And so you have an undemocratic Union. And it's known that there's a democratic deficit. Even the Federalists know that there's a democratic deficit within the Union. Okay, so now let's look at why I said that it would have been in the U.S. best interest to be friendly with Russia and to have agreements with Russia to offset this forming empire. So now I'm going to give you some really kind of startling facts. While nobody's paid attention, while we're butt-licking Europe, because they're essentially butt-licking Europe uh, by helping Ukraine, because... So let me give you some, some facts now, and you're going to understand why I said that Russia would have been a nice balance. It's too late now. 
It's too late. We have burned that bridge. We have pushed Russia into the arms of other nations that we're also in conflict with. They're whittling away at our dollar. Maybe it's not too late. It's actually never too late. But right now, Russia's on a different trajectory, and we're on the trajectory to be butt lickers. So let me let you know some of the things that have occurred that should be of concern. Well, first of all, there are about 10 candidate countries. And these 10 candidate countries, the EU is planning that they will be coming in. They want to have a treaty change before they do. They want to do away with the unanimity rules so that they could get decisions. They want the full defense union. But these 10 nations, when they come in, they will bring... Now, I eliminated Turkey because Turkey is listed among these, these nations that want to join or that's on the list. They're never going to accept Turkey. Just Turkey's out. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that Turkey's never going to be admitted. So I didn't include Turkey and I didn't include uh, Turkey's population. But right now, the EU is 448 million citizens. Mind you, the U.S. has 331 million. When these nations join, the EU is going to swell up to 511. It's million. So that means it's going to be over a half a billion citizens. Ukraine alone is like 41 million citizens. That's one of the reasons why Ukraine is so strategic for the EU, because 41 million citizens, it's the second largest landmass. It's also got the second largest army just by virtue of the number of citizens, but it's agriculturally rich. And when it straightens out, because you have to meet certain criteria to join the EU, when those things are ironed out and in sync with Europe's economy and with Europe's criteria, it's going to boost GDP. All of these nations, now the Balkans, they have some, they've got issues economically, but Europe is looking to help fix that. And all of these nations coming in will boost GDP. They're all going to end up using the euro, strengthening the euro. The euro is also being tweaked. There's what's called a capital markets union so that the union will look like the S&P 500 or be similar to it. And it'll be similar to the U.S. market in, in that all these nations will be coordinated and the banking union will do the same thing. So the euro is working fast at not only strengthening, but becoming a world reserve, the world's reserve. And right now, a lot of the world's reserve is held in dollars and they're looking to boost up the numbers now being held in euros. So it's going to swell up. So potentially, if the UK rejoins a bit down the road and under new leadership, this EU will easily have 578 million citizens. That's a lot of people. And when you consider that there's like 80 trade packs in the works and they've got far over the number of packs that the United States has, and they're a hub for world trade. They've got association agreements with other nations that aren't even members. Their sphere is large, much larger, and their economy is hedged. So not only all of this, but they're working hard between their Horizon program, which pouring lots of euros into new technologies and their next generation EU, the Green Deal, many other things that they are doing to ensure that they're going to have a strong, strong economy. But they're even doing more than that. And this is where this is going to, this is getting a little bit scary. They're have already begun to rewrite the rules for the world. And there's a misconception concerning a world, the world order. 
and new world order and world economic forum. And I know that I've got some people here that think that the world economic forum and this global that's throw that out the window. We're in an empire age. Putin understands it. Multipolar polls. Everything's changing. You've got China, you've got Russia, you've got um, European Union and the African Union is becoming a real competition for these other empires because it's so mineral rich. And it's got a workforce, that a promising workforce, because the population of workers under 25 is uh, promising for many, many companies. So everything is shifted now on the world stage. And we truly are in an age of empires, as Giver Hofstadt had stated and has stated uh, several times. And Europe is now doing what other empires are doing, and that is it's looking out for itself. So now let me share with you some of the things that it has already done concerning the United States. First of all, it has fined U.S. tech companies astronomical amounts because one of the rules it's written is its Digital Services Act and other laws that it has concerning monopolies and different things. And the nations that trade have to follow these. And so for Google, let's see, according to the think tank, American Enterprise Institute, in 2022, penalties on U.S. tech firms reached record highs, including a $506 million fine for Instagram, $103 million for Google, $908 million for Amazon, Apple, there was the $13 billion, Facebook, $110 million. I'm just throwing out figures now from this report. Qualcomm 2018, 997 million. It has astronomical fines on U.S. tech companies that surpass what its nations are even contributing to its budget. This should outrage Americans. But then for their COVID recovery, and this was when Trump was in power, and again, nobody was paying attention in our State Department. It went whoop, right over the heads. And there was a meeting in Brussels about the COVID recovery and bonds and funds, and they were going to use own resources. And part of that would be these taxes on tech companies and it's specific, specifically what's eyed is U.S. tech companies, as well as CO2 violators. And that's another thing that, that's another law that just came into be uh, in 2023, October 1st, their carbon border adjustment mechanism. So that nations, companies that are going to do business have to now have certain CO2 emissions. And if they don't file the paperwork, they pay fines. But also, if they're not in compliance, they pay fines. So they're going to earn a considerable amount again from the United States because we're like a major violator. I think we're fourth in the world. So we're up there in our CO2. So now we're going to pay more money. And there's even more than this. There's the battery directive. The battery directive is another groundbreaker. If we don't make batteries in compliance with theirs, guess what? It ruins our industry because now we have to change to make it in compliance with theirs and it helps theirs. That's another thing about the Green Deal. I want to tell you a panic move on the part of Joe Biden. Now, I know this is a panic move. You may, you're not going to know this is a panic move, but you're going to know it after this broadcast. The European Green Deal is really about prospering economy of Europe. Because if you can create new products, uh, you can keep the economy going. And especially if your products become an industry standard, 
throughout a country, throughout a continent, and throughout the world. So what they're essentially doing is they're setting the stage that they produce this standard. And guess what? They're going to prosper. They're going to become more powerful than what they already are. They already know that they're powerful. I'm going to play you just a little clip from Christine Lagarde, and we'll take a listen so that you could already know that not only are they know they're powerful, but they know that they can use this power to get other nations to do what they want them to do. So let's take a listen to Christine Lagarde. Yes, Borga, I think it's uh, really time for Europe to play team, to flex muscles. And I can think of five areas where we can be a formidable power. I've mentioned the purchasing power. I would mention the trading power. We are the top trading partner of 80 countries in the world. Now that is power. We are a formidable technology power. Why is Airbus winning the race? Because we've put our strength, our innovation capacity together. And I would add that we are a pension power. Their Green Deal, because Trump had pulled out of the Paris Accords, allowed them to get a jump start. So what does Biden do as a panic move? He comes out with the Inflation Reduction Act, and it's very ambitious. It's meant to be a counter to their Green Deal. But some of the moves in it are also protectionist, and now they're going to respond. So that is a move that Biden made. It's a panic move, that act on his part, because it's not being said in the media, but they're starting to the rules rewrite rules for the world. They're ensuring their economy. And so now let's take the, the fact, too, that their military, they had a meeting with Biden. And when they pulled Biden into that meeting, they let him know that NATO was like secondary. And what matters to them is their defense union and they're building their own defense. We're so quick in the United States to say our allies, our allies, like our, we've got all these besties. They're not our bestie. They're not. They're out for their own interests. But some of what they're doing is already hurting some of U.S. interests. And this is why I said it would have been smarter to have Russia as a balance because this empire I'm going to pay, play you a clip just in case you think I'm talking and blowing steam here. I'm going to play you a clip from Manuel Broso, who was the commission president around 2007. You're going to listen to this clip. This is an old clip. Listen to his description of the European Union. Sometimes I like to compare the European Union as a creation to the organization of empires. The empires. And uh, because we have the dimension of empires, but there is a great difference. The empires were usually made through force, with a center that was imposing a diktat, a will on the others. And now we have what some authors call the first non-imperial empire. We have, by dimension, 27 countries that freely decided to work together to pull their sovereignty, if you want to use that concept of sovereignty, and work together to add value. I believe it's a great construction, and we should be proud of it. At least we in the Commission are proud of can, our union. Can I add? Okay, so now let's take this a step further. Non-democratic union becomes extremely powerful economically, world hub for trade, hedged economy. U.S. dollar is going down. Russia's tanking U.S. dollar or helping to tank U.S. dollar. By the way, the European Union several years ago also made a decision that their energy transactions would be enacted in euros, and they were to eliminate dollars as well because they were upset. One of our sets of sanctions that hurt German companies, and after that, they made that decision. So they're also eroding the use of the dollar. You go to Europe, you don't use dollars. You're using euros in each country. At one time, you went to the European nations, you used dollars, not anymore. And then you take the fact of non-democratic. Well, what happens if a leader gets in there and he's really strong for Europe and we don't like it? 
guess what? We're not going to have a choice. We're going to have to lick butt. You know why we're going to have to lick butt? Because we're licking butt now. And we're going to have to lick butt because we already established this partnership. We've given them carte blanche. We're now giving them Ukraine. You might as well say, who's going to end up benefiting from Ukraine? I understand we're selling LNG gas to Europe, but what's our benefit? Europe's going to benefit. When Ukraine it becomes a member of the European Union, it's going to boost Europe's GDP, not ours. So we're helping build an empire that's already making us lick their butt. Next thing is going to have us licking their feet. I'm just, I mean, who would not be outraged at some of this? And I understand some of Europe's argument. I understand that there should have been attacks, but these fines? Whoa, staggering. It's robbery. And these are our allies. Well, this is why I said that the United States should have been looking to have relations with Russia as this empire is forming. So you've got to be forward looking. And what the think tanks are supposed to do are supposed to be able to judge and give some kind of direction. Well, I'll tell you, this is why I talk about our foreign policy. It doesn't make any sense. I've been following this. I've heard the statements. This has not been in American interest. I've known that. I, and I never could understand why we've always given it total carte blanche. Although now Biden is acting panicky with the Inflation Reduction Act. That was a panic move. And it's, a, it's meant to one up. But it may be absolutely too late. They've already set that ball rolling. They're already very, very powerful. We were not making trade deals while Europe was making more trade deals. Not only trade deals, association agreements. They've got an association agreement with Israel. It's an associate state. What are we doing? Except conflicts and spending more money. And we've got problems within our country. So they're growing, forming. We're declining. We've now missed that opportunity because we've so poked the bear, the Russian bear, that it would have been in our best interest to have better, stronger relations with Russia because as Europe is rewriting the rules for the world, we're not going to have much leverage. We're not our allies. We're part of the West. We're just going to go along with it, lick their butts. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, oh, you're going to take half the company funds? Okay, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Sorry. That was why I said it would have been in our interest. And you can even go further with this. Now, we're going to see if this democratic deficit gets dealt with. But many of the proposals for Europe, it's very, very, not only ambitious, but smart. Smart to make this. And, and let's face it, who doesn't want to be a powerful empire? Every empire, every nation wants to be strong. So you can't begrudge Europe for wanting to be strong. I want to just also mention the German myth. There's the myth that, you know, Germany was running the Europe. And while there are, you know, there's the French and German axis, and there are the leading countries that are the bigger countries. But Germany became economically prosperous because of the common market. So that's what made Germany strong. And that's a point that's missed. But now Germany is running into economic difficulties since the Ukraine conflict. This is why we've missed that boat, but it's maybe never too late. And it would be in our interest because the Europe that is forming is not forming with a view to pleasing the United States. It is forming with a view to what's going to make it strong, powerful, and what is good for its citizens. One last thing, I want you to check out my Amazon store. I got the link right up top now. And because I've been talking a lot about Russia, I want to give a little bit of a shout out to products from Siberia. And I have some products that are there from Siberia. I have a wonderful woman's cosmetic company that only uses the organic herbs from Siberia. Siberia 
is the most ecologically cleanest place in the entire world. You talk about the rainforest having wonderful products and possibly the future medicines. Well, Siberia has wonderful herbs and remedies. And one of the things I use, and I have especially have some from Siberia, which I just treasure is uh, to keep the pace that I keep. Sometimes I travel. I travel to other countries like people go to the next state. And I'm when I go with the European conservatives, I'm back in like four or five days. So how do I do it at my age? Because I'm an older woman. Rhodiola is one of them. Medicinal mushrooms, herbs, but rhodiola grows in Siberia. It is an adaptogen herb. Check out definitely the store, the Russian product. If you buy, I get commissions, which only helps my show. In the store is not only products from the different countries and then these wonderful products from Russia, which by the way, is hard to find because of the sanctions. And it's a tragedy because this area of the world has such products that are wonderful for health benefits. And why should we be denied that because of greed on part of the empires? And that's really what it is. So check out those products and check out the other products. Also, every time I have a guest, their book is featured in our Amazon store. So please check it out. Check out the Russian products. And the skincare line is really exciting because it uses certain oils that have just wonderful benefits from various plants in Siberia. So check it out. If you don't subscribe, subscribe to this channel like right now, like hit the button and stay tuned for more. Yeah.